Welcome to Zion Christian Ministry Facebook Live. Sunday afternoon now. The message today is another one of a series of sermons on the fruit of the Spirit. And the title, therefore, is The Kindness of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask as the word of God goes out that it will come into our hearts, it will bring us to the revelation of your goodness, your kindness, and everything you have for us. And so, Lord, pour out your spirit, not only here, but those who are at home who are listening, and all those who will listen in the future. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. The kindness of the Lord today. We'll start in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And gentleness and self-control. As such, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit. So we've already dealt with the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering. And now we're going to talk about kindness. If you're on Facebook at all, you saw the adventures my wife and I had on Friday. We killed a big old rattlesnake. Number four, That's huge. 11 and a half buttons, big fat one, <laughs> many, many maker. <laughs> and so while I'm preparing to write my sermon on Friday, I get the rattling in the house, underneath <laughs> the house. Kindness did not strike that rattlesnake. <laughs> but there's been a lot of distractions all weekend. And so I have a question for you. What fruit are we walking in, if any? It's my job to bring forth the word, to challenge you to know what Jesus wants you to be and what to do. Okay? So, kindness. In Greek, that word means this. Goodness in action, sweetness of disposition, gentleness in dealing with the benevolence and kindness. The word describes the ability to act for the welfare of taxing your patients. So when I had to share what I shared with you before we started the message, it tells you that my patients have been taxed. And so it seems like every week I'm not looking forward to when we get to some of the other fruits <laughs> what I'm going to have to face in me. So I want you to think for a moment that this kindness that God has towards us is a goodness in action. It isn't passive. And it, he has, ready for this, a sweet disposition towards you. That's how he feels about you. So when we see this word, this ability that God acts out of the welfare for us, and it does not tax his patient for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, it says this, that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He wants to show what? Exceedingly riches towards us. That word means abounding, overflowing. God is not a God who comes along and gives you just what you might need. He's not stingy. He's overflowing. He's abounding towards us. So this grace that he has for you and me isn't measured to us, okay, you only get a little bit. No, he constantly wants to overflow us with his grace and kindness towards us. And because of that, because of this, it is a proof of his mercy and goodness that we are to carry. 
Our conversion must be an encouragement to other people. Our transformation needs to be released out to others to see this abounding grace. You know the old saying, when you invite somebody to church, they're going to say to you, well, you know, you know how I've been living, and I'm, I don't want the, the walls to fall in on me. I don't want the, the ceiling to collapse. You know, what will happen, you know? Will hell freeze over if I show up? It's because they don't know that God's kindness is towards them. He's not here coming to us with a stick. He's coming with a heart and a disposition to gently deal with us. His kindness is overflowing. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says this. Remind them to be subject to rules and authority, to obey to be ready for a good work. To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards men appeared, not by the works of our righteousness, which we have not done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing, regeneration, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> In Titus, he says we're to submit ourselves to rulers and authorities. We are in the midst of a lot of confusion in our nation. As you can see, those watching at home, I have a mask hanging off my pulpit because I have it on until it's time to speak. See, you and I, according to the word of God, who are saved, it says in Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am now, I have a passport. And it's stamped, and I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. And my name is written in the book of life. And I have a citizenship in heaven. And I have the authority of heaven in me. And it says in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, no, 2 Corinthians, that I am an ambassador here. Hallelujah. Because I have now been transferred here to do a work for God. Hallelujah. I heard a man on uh, the radio one time talking about his salvation. He uh, got saved from another religion in the Middle East. And he said very clearly this. We get saved not to go home right away. We get saved to spread the gospel. Amen. To see everybody saved. Amen. And so we here now are submitted here. And we're citizens of heaven. And we're to submit to authorities. The reason I'm on Facebook isn't because I enjoy it. Because I'm a pastor, I have sheep, and people communicate that way now. When I was your age, just about, we still didn't have cell phones, and we had rotary dials, <laughs> and you used to listen and go, <laughs> <laughs> Now, some of you don't even have an ID, you just pick up your iPhone and uh, your smartphone, and it, it just instant communication. <laughs> But we now have an attitude in social media if you maybe see it once in a while or work with people and how they talk about things. We're not living in the most joyous season. Not really. Not everybody gets along with everybody. And I just warn you, as time marches on and we get close to November, it isn't going to get nicer. Because we all have a responsibility on November 3rd to register to vote and vote because you're a citizen of the United States of America. And that's your right. And I just, as a citizen of the U.S., I'm telling you as a pastor, that's what you should do. 
And I've been doing that longer than almost anybody in this room, because I remember voting the first time at 18 years old as a senior in high school. And they just changed the law. So I believed in it. But then I got saved. And then all of a sudden I realized that I have a higher calling. I love my nation. I love the rights I have. Is it perfect here? No. But now I'm a citizen who I rule over by a king named Jesus. And now I'm to act like a citizen of heaven, not like a citizen on earth. So we're right now living in a season where there is not a lot of goodness being released overall. Then we also have a pandemic where, last count I saw, over 170,000 people have died. And we've been blessed in Northern California, but the death toll is going up in Duke County. We have been blessed not to be affected like small towns in Mississippi or Alabama. We've been blessed so far, but may we not take the blessing and walk in our own rebellion and say, oh, well, what the heck? But we have a different citizenship if you know Jesus. You're to behave a little bit different. You're not to speak evil of no one. You're to be peaceable. You're like this one, gentle. And then you're also to show all humility to all men. Well, right now, I spent some time over the last few days People who I like, who I know are believers in other towns and things, I've had to unfollow. I got tired. Got tired of anger. Got tired of the hate. Got tired of division. Our opinions are free in the U.S., but it doesn't make them righteous. Yeah. Come on. We have a right to say what we want to say, but it doesn't make it good. But let me bring another attitude to you. If you're a citizen of heaven, you're going to have a different attitude. You have to walk different. You have to talk different. And bring, behave differently. Yeah. You're supposed to be humble to all men. We're not to be foolish. We're not to be disobedient. We're not to walk in deception. We're not to walk in various lusts or pleasures. We're not to live with malice or envy or infinite or hateful mm -hmm. or hating one another. So you know I'm not to talk like there's not an elephant in the room, because there is one. It's right here in the room. That if I was by chance just to put my political persuasion on Facebook and lie about it even, and watch the hate come, all I gotta do is put a D behind my name. Or I could put an O behind my name. And so the citizens of America believe that it's okay to hate. But the church is called to be different. The church is called to be like Christ. Yeah. So he came that all might be saved. He came in love for all. And now your citizenship of heaven should override what was written by man rather than what was now written by the Spirit of God here in Titus. Amen. We're to be different. And then realize when God goes through these things we're not supposed to do in verse 4, he says, but. At that moment, if you read scripture, <laughs> like you should, when God says, but, you should stop right there. Get ready for what he's going to tell you how you're supposed to be. He just got done telling you what not to be. Then he said, but. When the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, appeared. What was that kindness? Sweetness of disposition? Gentleness? Goodness in action? Kindness? God has the ability to act in the welfare of all of us? And we're called to be like who? In the fruit of the Spirit? Hmm. I wonder if God has a plan in this season. I wonder if Jesus 
has an idea what he wants to do in this nation. I wonder in the death, the fear, and all that's going on that God has a plan. Kindness and love of God, our Savior, towards man appearing. Well, between you and me, I'm, much as I'd like to go to heaven and see family, I don't want him to appear yet. You know why? Because I want more people to go with me to heaven. Amen. I don't want to just get out of this world because it's a mess for me. I want Jesus to come back when it's time. But if he's not going to appear, as he appeared, guess who's supposed to appear? You and me. We're going to make an appearance <laughs> on earth in who Jesus is. We're supposed to release who we are, who he is in us, to the world. That's right. See, we're going to show the citizens of this nation what the citizenship of heaven is about. We're going to show that there's something different that happens to you and me when we get saved. There's something that's supposed to be different, and it's got to get out of the hate, the anger, and the belligerent attitude that sometimes you might experience out there in the world. Man. We do. What if God has a plan? What if the church ain't listening? Because we're so worried about what might happen in November rather than what might happen tomorrow for somebody that doesn't know Jesus. What if we're really so happy with our salvation that we're not really concerned about anybody else's, but rather what we might not get or receive while on earth? Sir, I just got this feeling that God's in the mood of rebuking. <laughs> I, I got the feeling. You know how I know? Because I've got the rebuking. <laughs> I've got to sit down and read the scriptures, look at it, study it before I bring it to you. And if I really do what I'm supposed to do, I'm not to close off my heart and go, well, you know, God, I got it all together. It's that sheep out there, and I'm going to bring this to <laughs> That is a dangerous thing to do as a pastor. Yeah. Because God will go, <clears throat> you're clear his throat, kind of. You know, it's like, excuse me? Are you listening to the word? So whenever I'm bringing something to you, you must always remember, it isn't about what's wrong with you, it's what's right with you, that you need to know, but it's also to find out if there's something that needs to be removed, that the power and the grace and the kindness of God will remove it. Thank you, Jesus. But if you want to hang on to these things he tells you not to hang on to, you're not going to see the blessing that he wants to give you through leading people to him. There's no greater joy to take people and introduce them to Jesus. Yeah. And they really move into his, their heart. And it's so amazing every time when I got to experience it when they say, wow, what was that that left? What was that weight that was in me? What, what, well, you repented and believed and you took all your sins and you're a new creature now. And now you're a baby in, in Jesus and all this joy comes. If we could gain that excitement because of the kindness of God that's been given to me and you, I think there might be a world right now and the craziness that's going on that might want that. Amen. That's why it was so important before I started this message to tell you to pray and say to over churches. So, we're going to show the fellow citizens and then we're going to do what? It says here, whom he poured out on us, in verse 6, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by your grace, we become heirs according to the hope of the eternal life. We have something that has been given to us as an inheritance that is not us to keep for ourselves, but to give away. 
is to give away to those in need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says this, verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I wonder, what season are we in? What season are we really in, church? You are listening home. What's really God up to? Had he just said, oh, well, this lead the world to itself? No. That's why he sent his son to us. What is the accepted time now is for the church of Jesus Christ to walk regulars in the spirit. Love, faith, joy, long-suffering, kindness. I wonder why all of a sudden the timing of God has been worked through this time of sermons to speak about the Apostle Paul and the working of the Spirit that in this moment, for nine weeks now, we're going to go through each step of what it is to be a fruitful Christian in how you behave. I wonder if it was just by the roll of the dice, just a lucky moment for me to go, well, I think this is where God said to me. Or what if God really put it on my heart to release something over you and you at home and wherever this message goes that we begin to be transformed in what we're supposed to be? Come on. The fruit of the Spirit of God and not of the flesh. Not all the anger and the hate and the stuff that's going on. What if it says, we give no offense to anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Verse 3. What does that mean? That means when we don't walk as we're called, there's blame that's put on us. But our ministry to people and the love that we give them should be not with blame. No offense. We shouldn't offend people. We live in a season of high offense. It's sad that corporations are trying to protect people who are not making 80000 100000 a year that are bagging our groceries, stocking the shelves, so we can eat. And they ask us to think about them and put on one of these. So when Walmart said that, within a week, you know what they said? We're not going to enforce it because our employees are being threatened and are being hurt. Now think about that. That's crazy. It's not about, I want to go because i got to get some groceries today. <laughs> and i got to go in and I'm wear my mask. It's not for them. It's, it's not for me. It's for them. It's about loving people more than myself. Right. It's about caring for people more than myself. But we live in a culture right now that nobody should tell nobody what to do. Well, I got news for you. There's a king, and his name is Jesus. He's not going to be up for re-election. <laughs> He's not going to say, okay, if you want me or not want me. He is Lord of heaven and earth. All authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. And so he's asking the church of Jesus Christ to change who they are, that we might walk in that authority in the fruit of that kindness I'm talking about today. Amen. He says, but in all things we commend ourselves as minister of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in prisonments, in tumults, labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. You always have to throw fastings. <laughs> by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, here it is, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. By the word of truth, by the power of God, the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report, good report, as deceivers yet true. Unknown as well known as dying. Behold, we live as chastened, but yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet not making rich, have nothing yet possessing all things. Paul was a missionary to the world, the known world. 
this is what you went through. And what did he say? I don't want anybody to blame me for doing it wrong. Watch if the blame doesn't come to me. The blame goes to Jesus. If God saved our soul, our heart desire is not to bring disgrace to Jesus. So we have this fight right now, even within the church, on what to do. I told this morning group that the day comes when the law tells me I can't preach about sin, I will go to jail and preach sin. That there's forgiveness for it. If they tell me that I cannot preach the gospel, I will preach the gospel and I will go to jail. Or even hang if that's what they're going to do. Because it happens all over the world. I think that God is preparing it for that season, in this season, to be ready to spread the gospel with a little bit of affliction. I would like to have everybody that's here now and everybody that was here at 9 and everybody can hang together. I love to recognize people without look like they're bank robbers and, <laughs> and know who you are and see your faces, see you smile, see you make faces at me, whatever. <laughs> this is not fun. But we're doing it because we care about somebody else. Because God has not released the knowledge yet how to fix the problem. You know God can release it right like that. Yeah. But what's he asking to do? To do what we know what to do and trust him. Yeah. We're not doing too good a job of my thing. So, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of our salvation. I got mine. I want them to have it. Amen. I want them to know. Yeah. Amen, Pastor. 2 Peter says something rather interesting, verse 5, chapter 1. But for this very reason, given all diligence, add your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self control, to self control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Here it is. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even the blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Sir, I believe God told us to be fruitful. He's telling us that we're going to have this kindness and this loving kindness for our brothers and for the world. Do you understand that when we release the power of curses that they work? Because we're going to have what? Words of life or curses coming out of our mouth. And James, he tells us about what do you got? Fresh water, salt water. What do you want? But we think if we can type it on a message board that it's not really that bad. The worst thing I can do is to see a news article or something has happened and then watch the comments underneath the news release. I can only go so far before I gotta get out of it because I don't have loving kindness. I don't have patience. Like, let well, me you know. I know they were old, but they're old. They died. I remember when my grandfather died. He was old. He was 92. Wow. Wasn't a joyous day when he died. Did you hear it? Can you hear what's really in the air? Yeah. Until it happens to them. We have a spirit in the air, people, that's not Christ. And some of it's being released by those who claim Christ because they got the wrong letter behind their name. Because we're all wrapped up in what we think we might lose rather than what the church has received from Christ. I'm to have self-control. That's not always my strength. I'm going to be persevering towards what? Godliness. 
and then I'm to have brotherly kindness. But I shared with you the situation that the city's going through. I met what I said, and I said, pray for the situation. Because I want to have brotherly kindness. Because I looked at this word, and the word of God came and said, this is what you're supposed to be. Not what you feel, not your frustrations, not what you may be going through, but how are you going to behave in your heart for something that has come against you that may not be your fault? Kindness. i got to have what? i got to have welfare for others, and my patience might be taxed. You know what it is to be a pastor and to study that word and realize you got to take care of sheep? <laughs> my grandfather took care of sheep, real sheep. And they wander off every time. Only take one. <laughs> and off they go. And they get in the wrong field. They have to bring them back. Because sheep wander. There's a reason God calls us those things. Because we're known to wander and wander into the wrong field. I can scream all I want at you. Don't go there. And then you go there, and you know what happens to the shepherd? Pastor, I need your help. <laughs> I wandered into the wrong field. <laughs> well, my job is to have a kindness for the person who did that, because God has ki had kindness for me. But I wandered in the wrong place. What if we all walk that way? What if there is an awakening coming to the church in the midst of a pandemic, political turmoil, social injustice. All this is going on. Why? Why do you think this is? It's about our hearts. It's not after your mind. To be saved, you must believe in your heart. He's after a heart that's after his heart. He's after a heart that wants to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to abound in fruit and not be unfruitful. He doesn't want you to be short-sighted and not see what you're doing and what you're releasing in your behavior. He wants us to get to a place of loving Him in a new and fresh way. Willing to say, Search me, God. What would happen if we just for weeks stayed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, and talked about the fruit and say, God, is it in my life? Am I walking in it? Or are you going to let the atmosphere out there of hate and division and everything that's going on and fear come over your heart and guide you away from what God wants you to be? Something that popped out, I can't say it's going to come out right this time, but this morning in the message, what came out of my mouth is we come to get something here rather than be something. We come to church to get healed. We come to church to be blessed. We come to church to be filled. But that is all good. He does that. But he brings us here to be someone. Amen. And to be like someone. Jesus. And don't tell me it's too big a journey. It isn't. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. That's why he wants to pour it over you all the time. That's why he wants you to go and worship him all the time. That's why he wants you to know what the book says. What if this is the season that God is planning a great revival? That the people who are feeling hate on one side and feeling hate on the other side both get healed, delivered, and saved, and they are now reconciled in Christ. What if we care about those that hate us because we're Christians? What if we don't understand the battle that is before us? I believe that God is speaking, at least to me. As I prepared this message, it was a weekend of unbelief, temptation, not to be calm. Not to walk in what I had written down. And I had all kinds of things that I can't even talk about. But God had already said, This is who I want you to be. 
And I can tell you it wasn't easy to do. But his spirit was there. And it worked out because he went before me with his kindness in the situation I was in. He got to witness two people. By the love and grace I showed someone that they probably didn't understand I was given that person. Because they have to deal with people all the time in their blue uniform. And they have to see that instead of having someone arrested, someone kept saying to the person, I love you. Jesus loves you. It's going to be okay. At the same time, the officers were there to do their duty. In the end, they asked me to do it for them that I would be the one to help the situation. It wasn't because of me. It was what was put into me. When I wrote down, before all the weekend went crazy, his goodness in action, his sweetness of disposition, his gentleness in dealing with others, his benevolence, his kindness. It was Christ. His word. His words were powerful. I believe that something's coming to our church. I believe the day will come and we'll be able to get back together. And you're going to know who's here at 9, who's here at 11, who's here on Tuesdays. And you're going to be really surprised at what God is doing. You're going to be surprised the numbers have gone up when everybody else's churches have gone down. You'll be surprised at how many people contact us over Facebook in England, in Germany, in Africa. Right now, Scotland's online listening to us. This message that God has given me is not just for a red walk. Right. This prophetic message is to go out into the world. And you are bearers of it. And so, preparing this message, I could have stopped right here and said, the kindness is good, this is what you need to do. But I believe God gave me a prophetic word on top of that. And then another prophetic word that was given to me last week. I believe there's something in the air. And it's not just a hatred and division and sickness. It is Jesus Christ ready to pour his spirit into people who will surrender and said. I want to be like you. Amen. Yeah. Get the stuff out of me that doesn't line up with you. Let me live the way you want me to live. Let me give away your kindness to others as you've given it to me. Amen. So this word will not be on your screen. I personally didn't send it to Amanda. Because I wanted to read it to you. So you wouldn't be reading it up there. I think it's good you could follow me. But this word comes, I believe, in a moment to read you to know that God wants to do something with you. You're here not just to get blessed, but to be what you're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. To walk in something that we've been called to do in this season far different than the church has ever been prepared to do in this country. They do it in China. They do it in Africa. They do it in the Middle East because they learn how to walk in the presence and the fruit of God to release the kindness of God in the midst of persecution. We haven't learned yet, but God is bringing us to a learning point. Amen. So, in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 12, he says this. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, Bring your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord God, for he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and of great kindness. He relents from doing harm. Who knows if you will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind? A grain offering, a drink offering for the Lord your God. 
verse 18, he says this, that the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'll send you grain and new wine and oil, and you'll be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far from you the northern army. I drive away in a barren, desolate land with his face towards the sea and his back towards the western sea. His stench will come up. His foul order will rise because he has done monstrous things. The enemy will be defeated. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid. He has done marvelous things. For the open pastures spring up. The trees bear fruit. The fruit trees the vine their strength. Be glad then, children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he's given you former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down for you. And the former rain. Why? Wow. Today he gives me the scripture on Friday. And who knew in August, in a heat wave, we would have rain? Come on. He, knew. he knew. He's trying to get you to know he's speaking. Didn't expect it to be raining at my house today. <laughs> It will cause that rain to come down for you, the form and the latter. The threshing floors will be full of wheat. The vats overflowing with new wine and oil. So I will store your ears and the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You'll eat plenty and be satisfied. And praise the Lord for his name, who has dwelt wondrously with you. My people shall never be put to shame. And you know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. There are no other people to never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass that I will pour my flesh, my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Also, your maid servants and your men servants, I will pour my spirit on them in those days. I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth. People. <coughs> he desires us to awaken to something. I didn't know over the last two months going into the study of the Spirit that we would be here today. He knew. He knew there would be great destruction. He knew there would be great need. He would know that the people were hungry in the land. As I watched a mile and a half of cars in Dallas waiting for food. And you ready? They weren't old beat up cars. They were nice cars. Then they showed them in Atlanta, almost two miles long. And the woman who was giving out the food said, you don't know what it's like to tell them we're out. <coughs> Excuse me. Where are we, church? Where's our goodness? We're going to let the world do it? Are we going to rise up and see what we can do? Can the churches come together? Can you imagine what it would be like if it was the Church of Jesus Christ, there are churches doing it. There are ministries doing it. But there's many more worldly ministries doing it. And why is that? Why did the big money go to those places and not to us? To give it away. What if we've been bypassed because we've never been what we were supposed to be? What if they saw us the way we were supposed to be seen? And the ones who have been given plenty would give it to the church to give away in kindness. What if the Lord is first coming to his church to get us in a position to love people the way he loved me to save my soul? 
to deliver me from drugs and alcohol and all that he's done so I can just be happy with me or be hungry for those in bondage to be free. He's speaking in prophetic dreams, as I read to you in Joel, about dreams and visions, about being poured out, and that was released on the day of Pentecost. Last week, when I found out that I may have been exposed, or I was exposed to the virus, I had people I called for prayer, friends, pastor friends, in confidence, to keep me intent on this good dissertation, to rebuke me if they need to. They ask for wisdom in the situations that we face. And so one of the persons I called had a vision. Because they began to pray for Red Buck, and they prayed for this church. And they prayed for this ministry. And this is a vision she had. Yesterday when I got up about the word of the Spirit, it was with a hammer, and I received a vision. The hammer was a long-handled sledgehammer. The word was dragging on it and not swinging it, the Lord was. And every bit, he would turn to look down the hammer and twist it so it would hit the ground on one end. A little bit, a small pound of dirt, and then he turned and moved on, still dragging the hammer behind him in the dust and the dirt. So she said the next morning I began to pray about that vision and what was God saying. And as I was praying, I was thinking and talking to God, and I thought it was interesting he had not raised the hand much for it. And just bragged it many pounds that the vision came about. And I knew that yesterday's vision was for yesterday. Today's vision would be different. It was dark. It was black outside. And the Lord was there with a sledgehammer. All around him was a rim of fire, like a fire surrounding him. And he raised the hammer and brought it down on the ground in a mighty hit. Huge embers flew off the ground with each hit. And I thought the red around him was the fire of God. And he brought the hammer down and it caused the fire of God to fly out all around him. He really knew how to work the sledgehammer. And he raised it and brought it down two or three times before the vision ended. There was power and strength and knowledge of God that was in work in this fire. So, when someone gives me a prophetic word, I just say, oh, that's good. You know, I pray. And then I give it to other people. that I trust to pray. Is this God? Is there somewhere how we can find this in the book? And someone called me the next day and said, hey, did you know that the fire, the hammer, is five times in Scripture. Four times it's used for idolatry. But the fifth time it's used differently. So he goes, why don't you look up this word? So I did. Jeremiah 23 verse 29 says this Is not my word like a fire says the Lord and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces Bingo So with more prayer I believe this was the Lord's vision for us what does it mean? It means that the word is going to come with a hammer. The word has been coming over us with a hammer. I challenge you because of someone that helps with digital stuff. I'm on YouTube now. <laughs> and you can type in Pastor John McKim and I will come up in my messages. Please click on Please, the more to click on, the more that other people might find it. So you can now go back and look at the sermon on love, and joy, and peace, long suffering, now kindness, and you can begin to see a picture. It's God bringing the hammer. 
and it's a fire coming. Because what Jeremiah is speaking about false prophets in the land were not bringing the truth. But his word is true. His prophetic word would be true. So when this word was given to me is when I was told that I must go get tested. But you must understand, the day I was exposed, I gave a prophetic word to those men I was praying with. And the prophetic word was, gentlemen, the Lord has put on my heart to pray for every church that is not taking the precautions it needs to take because the enemy wants to bring the virus within the church that we would not be a good testimony. And we must pray protection for the church. And at that time, I was being exposed and didn't know it. At that time, I was not warned that I was, even though the prophetic word had told me. And I still haven't been warned, even though God has now warned the men of God to take precaution not to give his name a bad name. Church, the hammer is coming to break the hard heart. That they might know the kindness of God. Come on. The love of God. The joy of God. The peace of God. But we are the bearers of that word. We are called to be as he is. We are coming here to be different. To go out different. To be as he is. That the goodness that we have. That the dying world needs. That the broken world needs. That the bondage of people have been broken, and the hurt and the pain, and the children would be saved. I understand. I have all these people that are posting, save the children. And the next post, they're speaking hate towards somebody. What the heavens is that? <laughs> I minister to broken and trafficking kids. I know what they go through. I've been doing it for 20 years. We are to worry about our kids. But understand, we can't hate at the same time save. We have to love to save. Because Christ so loved the world that all would be saved. The word is being released from heaven, church. And we are being called to be different. Actually, we're being called to be a normal Christian. We're called to have a citizenship that reflects the identity of our homeland, heaven. And you're to bring heaven to earth in how you walk. The hammer is not to hit us. It is to break the hard ground that is in this land. It's to shatter what's been here forever so that the hearts will be touched. So that the soil will be prepared for the word to come and the spirit to be released. God is preparing a move of God and he don't need us, but he wants us to move with him. He's called us out of our apathy. He's called us to pray. He's called us to move into the deep things of God. He's called us to who he is and what his heart was that that would be our heart. So you who are listening at home, I can't see your face. And if you're listening, share it. Pass it on. If you believe I'm hearing from God, release it so that God is being released. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about what he wants to do with everybody in this room. He wants to get you healed up, fixed up, glorified up, and walking out in the glory of. He takes that which is broken and fixes it. He takes that which has no hope and gives them hope. He takes that which says there's no way things will change. But when God comes in the room, everything changes. Let him come in your heart today at home. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior at home or wherever you might be listening, today could be a great day. It's what you believe in your heart that transforms you. 
It's who you might be at home that you can say, I surrender. I don't want to be all those things that you read today in Scripture, but that I might be saved. I want Jesus in my heart. You invite him in, he'll come. But he will not trespass you. He will not violate your will. He will not force you to do nothing. But when you surrender all things to him, then all things of him comes into you. So I pray for you at home. I pray for all those. Potential spam, it says. <laughs> Awaken to his love. Awaken to his kindness. We, we have an opportunity. There's a song we used to sing. It says, do you want to be a history maker? We get to write the history of the land by what we choose. We get to write the history for our children and what they grow up in. We get to write the history of who Jesus is by how we walk, how we talk, and how we surrender. If you would so indulge me, would you stand and let me pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord. May people begin to enjoy a rebuke. Because a rebuke means you have a chance to change. A rebuke means that God is thinking highly of you to help you change so you can be highly like him. And so, Father, I ask peace over everyone in this room. And whatever they're dealing with in their life, may they know that Christ wants to help them. He's not an angry God. He's a kind God. He's a God who's patient with us. He has sweetness towards us. And he wants good action towards us today. And so, Father, I ask that you would touch every heart here and those who are listening, wherever they might be. And I do say hi to my friends in Scotland. And I ask, Father, that the power of the living God will come here and there. And in England. And back east. And wherever this world might travel. That there will be an awakening in the church, a revival that will begin to take that which is dead and bring it to life. That which will change us and our citizenship in heaven will be a reflection of who he is in us. And so Holy Spirit, have your way with our hearts. Touch us, fill us, and may we receive the love for us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless everyone at home. I'll see you Tuesday.